Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church, whether you're present here or present there. Uh, God is present with all of us. And we thank you for uh, being here today in, in both manners. Today is uh, also Rally Day, and so we're going to give, we're going to do a blessing of the Bibles, and then at 11:45, those who are not with us here will have will have a drive-through up at uh, the corner of Bull and Blanding. For those to join us there, you will get a sticker for your backpack, and I have it to give away, and a a prayer booklet. Uh, as well as today we're going to give Luke and Abigail and Evie are going to get a Bible. I believe I'm right. Those three are here with us today. Uh, and the others who are not here, we have Bibles for them if they come later today. So welcome again and let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake God forgives us of all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
The Lord be with you. Today, we give thanks to God for the gift of the Bibles that you see on the altar, which will be distributed and given three this morning during the children's sermon. And we will ask a blessing that God will use this word to go into the home and do what God's word always does, produce great fruit. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, for the gift of your word, we thank you. And we send this word out and ask that you will bless every home that is represented here and every home that is watching this morning, that your word will strengthen, encourage us, especially now in the midst of this pandemic. And now, Lord, you are a merciful judge. You are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And while he is coming up this morning, we have if e Evie, Evie, and Luke, and Abigail, if you would come up. Uh, and if you want to stay for this uh, children's sermon, you may. But if you want to go back, you may do that. We have for you. First, we have for your backpack this. Let's see. There are you folks at home. There we go. We're not quite to the fancy part yet where we can zoom in, but we're close. This says, Learning, Loving, Living God's Worth, Rally Day, September 13th. I think that's what that says. I'm guessing. <laughs> um, and then on the back it has Matthew 28, 19, and Luke 6, 31. There's for Luke and Abigail. And heavy. And we also have for you a prayer sheet. And then Philippe's got a word he'd like if y'all want to come and sit down and hear it, or if you want to go back to your seats, that's okay too. And you can listen from there. But we also have for you a Bible. Let's see. Luke, you get the big adult one, man. There you go. And Abigail, there's one for you, dear. That's ah, heavy, isn't it? Heavy. There we <laughs> You got it? All right, so now the assignment is we give it to you and you read it for next week. Now they're laughing because they know that's not true, but you know what? If you read it, it'll bless you. I've been studying this book just about my entire life, from college to seminary, post-seminary, and it's blessed me in ways I can't begin to tell you. So, God bless you and watch over you in this. I know this is going to be a difficult season of, of school. It's a little different, isn't it? Is it different? Yeah, my granddaughter's going to school with a computer. So, But you know what? This is all going to pass, and, and, and you're going to get to go back like normal. But we want God to watch over you and protect you, okay? I'm going to turn this over to Philippe. He's going to share a, a message, and if you want to come and sit... You kind of spread out. You got, got a little science project. Yeah, a little science. Come on up you, if, if you want, and you can sit right in there. All right. For those of you at home, just bear with us. All right, here we go. Okay, so today, in this story, we're going to talk about Pharaoh. Pharaoh is it on? Okay, Pharaoh was a bad king, and he refused to let people go. So after the ten plagues, Pharaoh finally decided to let them go, but he changed his mind again. The Israelites, God's people, were afraid because they were stuck between the army and the Red Sea. So we have some water here. 
So that's just water, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to add some pepper. Okay, y'all see the pepper? Okay, when I stick my finger in, what happens? Anything? No, nothing at all. Okay, now what if I put a little bit, I'm going to add a little more pepper so y'all can see it. Okay. So now I'm going to add a little bit of dish soap on my finger. It up. What's supposed to happen, you can try it at home. It worked at home earlier today. Let's try it again. I think I mixed it too much. Okay, give us 10 seconds here. I'm going to try one more thing. It's probably, it's probably have to stay a little bit too long. So, what's supposed to happen is when you put dish soap on your finger, it causes the water to split the, and the pepper to go to one side, but it, I think it's messed up because I already have dish soap in the water. Okay, so try it at home because I've tried it twice and it worked perfect for me. So anyway, so explain why we did that. Okay, <coughs> so this was like when Moses split the sea, so that's what that was supposed to be. Um, so Moses was not afraid and trusted God. Moses then raised his hand over the sea to part the sea. Israelites were able to walk, and the Egyptians all drowned because of God's power. The Israelites were amazed at what God has done. God caused the waters of the sea to separate, just like our pepper trick. And God is powerful and protects his people, including us. So, let us pray. God, thank you for saving the Israelites. Thank you for showing us in big ways and in small ways that you are powerful. Remind us when we feel afraid or confused that you protect us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is Genesis 50, 15 to 21. After Jacob's deaths, the brothers of Joseph begged for forgiveness for the crime they had done against him. You intended to do me harm, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. The reading from Genesis. Realizing that his father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, Forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do me harm, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord.
second reading is Romans 14, 1 through 12. The Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here Paul helps us understand that despite different practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for all of us and will judge each of us. The reading from Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. We live... We live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall pray, give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. In today's gospel, Jesus uh, and Peter have a conversation where Peter asks about how much he's supposed to forgive someone or the limits of his forgiveness. And then Jesus tells him a parable and suggests that human forgiveness should mirror the unlimited mercy of God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. 
But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord that had what had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to, the, to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know this word today is, is particularly challenging. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit will help us to hear it and also apply the principle of forgiveness to our lives. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> so we're going to do a little bit of math this morning. And I, I'll walk you through and I'll remind you of the numbers. So if you want to write them down, you can, uh, but you don't have to. During his life on earth, Jesus lived, of course, as we know in the Roman civilization. And the Romans had 11 different denominations of money, just like we have, you know, five, a 10, a 20, a 50, a $100 bill, a, a penny, nickel, dime, quarter, half dollar, that sort of thing. So here, here are the, the measures of money they had. Drachma, a D drachma, a mina, shekel, stator, denarius, talent, half shekel, Assyrian, quadrants, and lepton. The ones we're concerned about today are two of those which occur in the New Testament reading here in Matthew chapter 18, and that is a denarius and a talent. So we're going to talk about those two. Now, before Nero, who is after our Lord, who was emperor, before he devalued the currency, we wouldn't know anything about that in our country, of course. But before they, he devalued the currency, uh, it, one denarius was one day's labor. A common, unskilled laborer would get one denarius for working usually eight hours, maybe longer, but a day's labor. So hang on to that for a minute. Another measure, as I've said before, is a talent. A talent. One talent is equal to 6,000 denarii. So, if you're doing the quick math, you would take 6,000, and let's assume the person works the whole year, 365 days. Let's just make that assumption. Probably not, but if they did, 6,000 divided by 365 days is equal to 16.44 years. This means that a laborer in the Roman civilization living at the time of Jesus would have to work 16 and a half, we'll round it up, 16 and a half years for one talent. You already know where this is going, don't you? 
With that in mind, Jesus tells a parable today about forgiveness. And Jesus gives us a comparison of debt that is owed. One slave of the king owes 10,000 talents. Now hopefully you see the hyper size of that debt. Of course, part of me is asking as an American citizen, one who has a mortgage on my home and thinking, who in the world would loan somebody 10,000 talents? And this is a slave, a common laborer. So the slave would have to work. Now here's the math. If one talent is equal to 16.44 years, then 10,000 talents is worth 10,000 multiplied by 16.44. You got it? If he owes 10,000 talents, and if he has to work 16 years for one talent, then he's going to have to work 164 years. 1,400 years. Seriously. Seriously. On the one hand, what was the king thinking? When he gave that kind of money. But even more seriously, what was the king thinking when he forgave that debt? Put it in today's thinking. Can you imagine if you went to the Bank of America or the bank of your choice and they gave you a mortgage loan for 164,400 years? I'd love that kind of payment. But that's not what we're talking about. This slave gets his debt forgiven. All of it. Wiped out. No more. Gone. Over. 164,400 years worth of labor completely marked off the books. Done. <laughs> That's a pretty big measure of forgiveness. Now this same slave, just keep this in mind, this same slave who's gotten all of this forgiven goes to one of another slave who owes him 100 denarii. And how, how long you got to work for 100 denarii? 100 days, right? 164,000 years? 100 days. That's all this guy owes him. So he goes to this slave and he says, pay me what you owe. And the, and the guy begs and pleads and says, no, I, I, help me, give me time, I'll pay you everything I owe you. And the truth is he probably could. He could probably do it. But what does this guy do? The text says he grabs him by the throat. He aggressively grabs him by the throat and has him thrown into prison. 164,000 years, 100 days. Hmm. So given this story, what do you think Jesus is trying to tell us about forgiveness? The story opens, or the reading opens, with Peter and Jesus having a conversation. Peter, he's the guy, you know, he walked on water and then he sunk. He tells Jesus, no, you're not the one who's going to go to the cross, but we've got to give it to this guy. He's a leader. And so leaders sometimes speak, and he does, and he sticks his foot in his mouth. So he says, hey, John, you, you know, let's suppose we're in the church together. How many times I got to forgive you, the person in, in the church? Seven times, Jesus? Seven times? Seven times? Seven's a complete number. So it has this idea of fullness. So that seems like, you know, seven days of creation. So it's, it's become a sort of a perfect number, if you will. And Jesus says, no, 77 times. So I guess on the 78th time, you, you get a pass. Now, some translations say 70 times 7. And if you read the Greek language, it's kind of hard to decipher. So some scholars go with 70 times 7. 
and others say 77. So if it's 70 times 7, 490 times. So on the 491st time, I don't forgive you anymore, right? I love the way N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, says it. And I quote, If you are still counting how many times you've forgiven someone, you're not forgiving them at all, but simply postponing revenge. Close quote. As a Lutheran pastor and one who has German roots, I am often fond of reading about those pastors who lived during the Third Reich because so much has come from that. And one in particular was Martin Niemöller. You probably have heard about him. He's most famous for a poem. They came for the socialists, you know, and nobody spoke up for them. They came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up for them. And then they came for me. There's nobody left to speak up for me. So that poem has made Martin Niemöller somewhat famous for his perspective, but he was convicted for crimes against the state of Germany. Now keep in mind that if you read about this guy, Martin Niemöller was also a soldier. He was quite a soldier for the German army. He captained U-boats and was, was one who... Uh, was, was a decorated soldier, let's put it that way. Was, he was one who uh, was given a mission and accomplished the mission. So he was also, when he was convicted of treason, he was a political prisoner of high value. So what do you do with a guy like that? So they took him and put him in a concentration camp, Dachau for one. That's where they put him. And they put him in a cell with a view to the gallows. So not only regularly, every day, he gets a view and he sees them being marched to the gallows and being hanged. And he hears their cries, their screams, their curses, and often saying things to their prosecutors, criminals, scum, you name it. And he says that that taught him a lot about life and who he was. And it caused him to ask a couple of questions. Number one, what will happen on the day they leave me there and put me to the test? When they put the rope around my neck, what will be my last words? Will they be, Father, forgive them, or will I do like all the others and yell and curse and scream? Nemoer went on to say that if Jesus had cried out from the cross, curses and revenge against all humanity. There would be no church. You and I wouldn't be here. There would be no New Testament. There would be no Christianity. Because we know that though he was scourged, humiliated, crucified, and died, one of his last words from the cross, you know, Father, for Give them. They don't know what they're doing. More than 20 years ago, I stood at the bedside of a man who was dying. He was a man who loved words. He would often say, this is my word of the day. He'd give me a word, you know. Sometimes I'd scratch my head and think, where did he find that one? I was at his bedside. He was dying. He knew it. I knew it. We were talking around the topic. You know how that is. Sometimes you just don't want to face it. It's the end. You know it's happening. So we shared a lot of things. He said, you know, my word for today is obliterate. 
It took me a while. We talked about that and what that word means. You know, it just kind of wipes, just gone, gone. It took me a while. After I'd left the hospital and was off somewhere else, it kind of hit me, and I'm thinking, boy, did I miss that. My Stephen ministers know what I'm talking about. I, I just missed it. He was trying to say, God obliterates. Think about it. Obliterates the sins. And as we prepare for that last hour, that's our prayer and our hope, that God is obliterated. In the cross of Jesus, sins are obliterated. Sins are destroyed. Sins are removed. Sins are even forgotten through the infinite love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord who died on a cross, God chooses in His Son, Jesus, to regard your sins as having never existed. Can, can you comprehend this? 164,000 years, 100 days. Divine forgiveness is just that, it's divine. And not one of us, not a one of us can live a life of forgiveness until we fully grasp the cost, the huge cost, the immense sacrifice of Jesus on the cross who endured and accepted all of our sins. It was literally put on Him. It was put on Jesus Christ, your sins, my sins, the world's sins there, and then put to death. It died. It's done. It's over. It is, he said, tell us die. It is finished. It's over. So if, if someone offends you, or, or better, maybe I should say, when, what do you think? <laughs> All right? When someone offends you, look at the cross. Just do that. Some people say, I, I can't forgive them. Oh, okay, I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to say, look at the cross. If someone hurts you, look at the cross. If someone belittles you, look at the cross. And when you look at the cross, see Jesus and see the crown of thorns and see the piercing in his side, see the blood, see the scourging, see the, the, the horrendous death. Just look there. Just look at that. And if you cannot forgive, if you just cannot bring it to yourself to forgive whoever it is that has hurt you, look to the cross and beg, just like the guy in the story, beg for mercy. Because if there's anything that stunts our spiritual growth, it's hanging on to old stuff. Old hurts, ancient words of humiliation and hurt, bygone conflicts, former frustrations, long ago dissension and strife, hanging on, holding on. Today is the day and the time let it go. Really? I'm talking to myself. Let it go. Put it there. Obliterate it. Look to the cross and see the dying figure of Jesus who loves and forgives and sees all of your sins. Sees them and then says they never existed. Do that, and then live in the freedom, freedom of God's mercy and love and forgiveness. What a wonderful life in Jesus Christ we have. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Father Almighty. Let us pray. Search our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, and help us to see as we read your holy word where we have fallen short of your glory, but also help us to feel and experience the power of your Holy Spirit that announces and declares our forgiveness. Make your church an outpost of your mercy, a heavenly home of forgiveness. Teach us, all leaders, and all of us who participate in the ministry of our congregation to not only explain but practice in our lives forgiveness. Make it part and parcel of our worship. Equip our members to pray for and share forgiveness with others and help us to look to you, O Lord, in your sacrifice on the cross and the gift of life you have given to us all, Lord, in your mercy. Bless our schools, colleges, seminaries, and home schools as they embark on a very strange and difficult journey this fall. Strengthen our teachers and parents, and bless these children, especially those in our midst this day those watching and those here. God and protect them and help us, all of us, to make prudent decisions even as we make mistakes. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to us, O Lord. Help our leaders to rule with justice, tempered with mercy and compassion. Bestow on all of us a spirit of patience, humility, kindness. Teach us to outdo one another in showing mercy and righteousness. Lord, in your mercy. Renew the life and health of all who are afflicted in any way. Lord, we especially remember those who are living alone, those in nursing centers who've been cut off from their loved ones and whose hearts literally ache to be hugged and cared for and spoken to by their family. Hasten the day to the end of this pandemic that we may be restored to full community in love and sharing with one another. We lift up before your throne of grace all those we would now name in our hearts or on our lips. Lord, in your mercy, Into your hands, merciful Father, 
we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. This past Sunday in Gatlinburg, I was able to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Gatlinburg. And during the sharing of the peace, they simply waved at one another. So that seems like an appropriate thing. <laughs> May the peace be with all of us. We give thanks to God for the gifts you share of your time and your talents and treasures. Please remember that we continue to function as a congregation. Our ministry continues. As you give and God blesses what we give, we give thanks for that. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth, and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father. This is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Lord, give us this bread always. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given and shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you. The Lord Jesus bless you. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given and shed for you.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you to eternal life. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace, share the good news.